is a fact. 80% of alcohol sales are paid for by alcoholics. When we think of highbrow intellectual discussions about mental health and mental illness, we all think of South Park, right? <laughs> I'm not having a glass of wine. I'm having six. It's called a tasting and it's classy. I love South Park. <laughs> I remember sneaking down and watching it after my parents went to bed when I was a kid because I wasn't actually allowed to watch it. But on this video, we're going to look at an episode that's all about addiction. Some stuff is spot on. But why do companies have to put so many addictive things out there? Some of it's absolute nonsense. You've got to get down on your knees. And you've got to say, I have a problem. Ready? Let's crack on. There's a new Terrence and Philip mobile game, and it's so amazing and incredibly fun. Oh, really? Yeah. And the most unbelievable part, it's totally free. Sounds too good to be true. You should download it to your phone right now. I mean, come on. If it's free, why wouldn't you? Jimmy's the drug dealer for this new game. Cool. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, I'll check it out. You bet you, pal. Start off with a free taste up, and they'll be back for more. Mobile gaming. We thought you would be pleased with the quality of the mobile game. It's the dumbest game ever. All you do is collect and spend Canada. Hey, we know the game's not great, but who cares? It's free. But it's not free. If you charge 40 cents He's here and 50 us. cents there, then it's not free. They see through the charade. Uh-oh, you think so? I think they see through the charade, yes. I'm pretty sure they can hear us, too. Ingenious. <laughs> Nothing in this world comes for free. Allow me to explain the science behind micro-pay freemium gaming. For years, the concept behind gaming was simple. You pay for the game and you enjoy. With mobile apps, we now have the ability to make games that are boring and stupid. But if you pay for incentives, you're rewarded. Freemium. The meum is Latin for not really. So this is all about gambling. And... Gambling is based on some very simple and common learning principles. The first is operant conditioning, which is learning by outcomes. Desired behavior can be reinforced with reward. Undesirable behavior can be diminished through punishment. How long that learned response persists though, depends on something else, which is the second principle called reinforcement schedules. And there are four types. The first is a continuous reinforcement schedule, which means that the desired response or the desired behavior is rewarded every time in a very predictable way. Every time I put money into a vending machine, I get what I pay for. I know if I keep going to work, then on this date, every single month, my salary comes in and I know exactly how much that's going to be. So then we quickly learn that doing that behavior leads to that desirable outcome. But if that reward stops, then the behavior stops quite quickly. If that vending machine stops giving me my packet of crisps every time I put money in, then I'm going to quickly stop putting money in. So with a continuous reinforcement schedule, we're quick to learn, but that response is quick to extinguish if the circumstances change. No reward, no behavior. The second schedule is a fixed ratio schedule. The response is rewarded after a predictable number of responses. A rat gets given a food pellet when it presses a lever five times. So not every time, but after a predictable number of times. The third is a variable interval schedule. The response is rewarded after an unpredictable amount of time. Like going fishing. I never quite know when that nibble's going to come. And then the fourth is a variable ratio schedule. The response is rewarded after an unpredictable number of responses. And this one is the key one. This is how slot machines work. And slot machines, while boring, are the most common mode of gambling. Learning from a variable ratio scale, so a reward after an unpredictable number of responses, is the learning that's most likely to persist, to keep the behavior going. As you never quite know when that buzz is going to come. Let's have a couple more goes. Oh, it must be coming soon. Oh, maybe the next one. The next one might be the winner. I'll just do a couple more. Just one more. You're in big trouble, Stanley. Can you explain to us how you managed to spend $489 on a mobile app? I'm sorry, I didn't realize I spent that much. You didn't realize? What are Canadian coins? You buy Canadian coins so you have Canada. Stan, just because I make a good living with my music doesn't mean you can go blow it all on Canada. I'll pay you back for it, okay? How? I don't know. I'll figure it out. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, Lord. Not realizing how much you're spending is a common tactic to get you to keep going. As you never know, the next bet might be the winner. Variable ratio reinforcement schedule. So time and spending runs away from you. You know, casinos have no clocks or windows. That's the classic example. If you don't know how long you've been there and you're playing with, you know, not actual money, not physical money in your hand, it's chips or, you know, in this case, you're just clicking a button for more stuff. Time and money runs away from you. Can you believe him? He knew how much he was spending. He knew he'd get in trouble, but it didn't matter. I hate to say it, but this is a lot like his grandpa. What do you mean? Dad's always had a gambling problem. He's got total addiction tendencies. Could he have somehow passed those demons down to Stan? Well, and you certainly have some of those problems too with drinking. I had a problem, but I was able to stop. Now I only drink gluten-free beer and wine. 
Much better. Addiction at its core is a disorder of motivation, where somebody is using a substance or engaging in a behavior to a point of impairing your day-to-day -day function and you're holding it as something of greater importance than the sort of basic but fundamental other aspects of our life, you know, shelter, food, relationships, making sure we've got a steady income. In terms of diagnoses, we have substance use disorders, gambling disorder, and now in the ICD-11, gaming disorder. And so in conclusion, the successful freemium game is based on five principles. Entice the player with a simple game loop, use lots of flashing to chings and compliments to make the player feel good about themselves, train the players to spend your fake currency, offer the players a way to spend real currency for your fake currency so they'll forget they're spending money, and make the game about waiting, but let the player pay not to wait. It's a surefire way to make lots of money. And the waiting is the bit. You keep holding on because maybe that reward is coming and then you might pay to kind of hurry that along a bit. Just a bit longer, just a few more goes. The same principle as what's been used on slot machines for decades. It really is not reinventing the wheel. Oh, uh, hey guys. You missed school today? Yeah, I just wasn't feeling the best. Did you play the Terrence and Philip freemium game all day? Well, yeah, I was sick in bed. What else was I gonna do? How much money did you micropay today, Stan? Nothing. Dude, I bought like $10 worth of Canada. But check it out, I unlocked a stadium in Toronto. So he's prioritizing the game above going to school and above even looking at his friends in the eye. So within the broader diagnosis of substance use disorders, we consider harmful use when someone is using that substance to the point of causing themselves physical and or mental harm and then keeps using it regardless of that harm. And then we have dependent syndromes where somebody is using it to the point of developing pharmacological tolerance. So you need more and more to have the same effect. And then you get withdrawal symptoms in the absence of that substance that then are only relieved or alleviated by taking the substance. Gambling disorder and gaming disorder are singular diagnoses, but they both have three core principles in common. Impaired control over doing it, prioritizing it over other life interests and daily activities, and a continuation or escalation of it despite an awareness of the negative consequences. But just look at all the things we're getting to build. Soon Canada will be as advanced and developed as Michigan. We're just I mean, some people Michigan, will abuse but... the game and start spending more money than they can afford. Oh no! Well, we certainly wouldn't want that. Oh, oh, I have an idea. How about we take some of the billions of dollars we are making and we start a campaign to teach everyone to play the game in moderation. Oh. Mm, that'll do it. Do you really think that would help? Of course. The alcohol industry does it all the time. The alcohol industry, the tobacco industry, the gambling industries are excellent at trying to police themselves, showing faux concern for the harms. To be honest, parts of the food industry are the same as well. The issue is that then these industries violate their own guidance quite routinely, particularly when it comes to the marketing and trying to expose the substance that people are addicted to, to the people that are uh, you know, most vulnerable to potential harm with basically little to no consequence. And then there's economic interests in self-regulation, including from our own governments where you know taxation means that these industries are a core component of our economy, which is directly at odds with the public health harms. You, friends, fun, drink, hot girls, more, you're hot, more, drink more, more, more expensive more. cars, ass, drink, ass, money, tuxedo, threesome, vodka, pussy, drink, 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 you, drink, Vegas, fun, pussy, you, in a tuxedo, vodka, drink, 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 drink it all, you f***ing pussy, more cars, more pussy, more vodka, drink, drink, drink. Please drink responsibly. If you don't laugh, you'll cry at actually how unfortunately real <laughs> that is. I find the worst ones in the UK are the gambling adverts during the football. Please gamble responsibly. There you go. That's your grandpa. He sits at that slot machine and mindlessly drains money away a little bit at a time. Sound familiar? All the little sounds and lights are calculated to keep him sitting at that stupid machine. Come on, Dad, we're going home. I'm going. Do you know what you've done to your grandson? You've infected him with your bullshit. See, slot machines, our discussion has come full circle. Well, what about you? You're having a glass of wine. I'm not having a glass of wine. I'm having six. It's called a tasting and it's classy. Dad, I'm not addicted. I can stop. I just like like playing it, but I don't have to. I'll prove it. Yeah, and if he stops, I'll stop. All right. And if you two stop, then we won't have a problem anymore. Hmm. Earthy, bold, hint of cherry aftertones. This is an excellent example of cognitive dissonance, which is an important component of addiction and a target for psychological treatment. Cognitive dissonance is where your thought pattern and your behaviors are not aligning with one another. I know drinking is bad for me and I know it's hurting me and harming me, yet I keep doing it. That's a contradiction. And what happens in addiction is rather than changing the behavior, people change the thought pattern to match and basically condone the behavior. Oh, I don't drink as much as that person. I can stop anytime I want. I don't really have a problem. I'm just a social drinker. Psychological 
techniques like motivational interviewing are designed to try and help somebody come to that light bulb moment where they realize that cognitive dissonance is there and then they realize it's not the thought pattern that needs to change it's the behavior that needs to change you start helping someone to develop some insight and then insight hopefully can lead to change though it doesn't always lead to change you're saying these games do this on purpose why do you think freemium games send you those text notifications when you haven't played in a while it's called the trigger a quick image to trigger the addict's brain they know exactly what they're doing hey buddy come on guy come back friend you've got new buddies guy we've just given you five thousand canadian coins enjoy your canada free it's like the Duolingo owl. Does he hate that owl? Does Duolingo make you pay? It gives you the same sort of reward principles with tokens and stuff though, doesn't it? All of you that are watching this are gonna notice this whole principle more and more with all the different apps that you use. You need to realize that you have something in your brain that you somehow inherited from your grandpa that makes you act this way, okay? I don't know how you can say that when you're standing here chugging beer. I am not chugging beer. I'm sampling a flight of gluten-free German lagers with a French wine pairing. It's called a smorgasbord and it's elegantly called Cultural. Exactly how the French do it. Right. Addiction, like every mental disorder, has an element of heritability, i.e. a genetic component to the risk of developing that illness and a, an environmental one alongside that as well. The heritability of alcohol dependence is somewhere between 40 and 50%. So 40 to 50% of your risk of developing alcohol dependence comes down to genetic risk factors. Not just single genes, but multiple genes. Each one alone kind of giving you a slightly elevated relative risk of the disease, but then working in synergy and, you know, combination with one another. The genetic risk factors in neuropsychiatry disease are polygenic multiple genes rather than monogenic down to one singular gene that might then be you know inherited from generation to generation so inheritance and heritability different but related concepts what all the addiction programs say is true you've got to reach out to a higher power Stan. you've got to get down on your knees and you've got to say i have a problem and you've got to ask that higher power for help most people will have heard of the 12 step program, which has a big spiritual component. There are non-spiritual alternatives too, and adapted forms of psychological therapy, like adapted forms of cognitive behavioral therapy. The evidence shows that one is not necessarily better than the other. And really what's most important is that you develop and you get a stable, sober support network. So wherever you feel most comfortable to get that and to continue attending and continue receiving support, that's the way to go. So you've got dopamine, right? That's the chemical that gets released in your brain whenever you do something pleasurable, yes. like eating, sex, and that's just nature, right? Like rabbits and fish and shit. They need dopamine so that they want to consume and reproduce. Exactly how I teach it. <laughs> so dopamine is an important neurotransmitter that is involved in addiction and is involved in the so-called reward pathway. This pathway starts in an area in the midbrain called the ventral tegmental area. That's where a lot of your dopaminergic projections will start in the brain and then have pathways to a structure called the striatum in the basal ganglia, specifically a structure within the striatum called the nucleus accumbens. When dopamine is released here, it can reinforce a behavior as something that we liked that is desirable and therefore we may want to do again. Now this circuit is not what's responsible for addiction in isolation. There are lots of other circuits that all communicate with each other. So this communicates with the amygdala, which is important in emotion regulation. How do we feel? Was this an exciting experience? Was this a frightening experience? It's linked with the hippocampus in memory formation. We need to remember if we liked it or not, but to know whether we want to do it again. The prefrontal cortex involved in decision-making, the anterior cingulate cortex involved in outcome prediction, particularly in novel, so new and unexpected situations oh, I think if I do this, I think I might quite like this. Therefore, do I want to do it? What are the odds that if I do this particular act, this particular outcome will occur? And therefore, do I want to do it? Multiple neurotransmitters in multiple circuits all interacting with each other in a irritatingly complex way. That's neuroscience. It's like being diabetic. You know, it's like you can eat wrong and eat wrong and chemicals get released from your liver in a weird way. You know, you've been eating gluten and shit. And then eventually you've got a chemical imbalance from your liver and something clicked and now you're diabetic forever, right? So like if you keep doing something too much, eventually there's um a dopamine f up, right? And you're kind of screwed up for life. They were doing quite well until now. <laughs> Chemical imbalance is a meaningless term. We need to do away with it in all discussions about the brain, particularly in conditions like depression, where it's usually the go-to explanation for how SSRIs work, just because it's a shortcut and people are short of time. Mental illnesses, including addiction, are complex brain disorders with biological, psychological, and social components. Biologically, it extends beyond dopamine. We talked about all those different circuits that are involved, which means it's not just about dopamine, it also involves acetylcholine, noradrenaline, serotonin, endogenous opioids, glutamate. That's just to name a few. Let's talk about genetics now. You still have time? Yeah, no, this is great. Okay, let me get some visual aids. Give me just a sec. 
Here is a fact. 80% of alcohol sales are paid for by alcoholics. Using slot machine tactics, freemium games are able to make millions off of an even smaller percentage of mobile gamers. Oh, God, he just doesn't stop. Who is this guy? We're building a new Canada with micropayments from addicts. Who cares? You think the f***ing alcohol industry cares? They don't care that 10% are gonna get addicted. They're counting on it. Unfortunately, it's... Scarily true. On every attic screen, every button they click, we get feedback on how to shove this shit right down their throats. Why does he suddenly sound like Al Pacino in Devil's Advocate? Our economy arguably depends on addiction. Scary and sad, isn't it? Japan, about a year or two ago, even had a campaign trying to encourage people to drink more because after the pandemic, there was such a drop in tax revenue because of a drop in the sale of alcohol. But why do companies have to put so many addictive things out there? You know, they all do it and it's kind of my deal. I've got to put temptation out there too so people have free will and all that shit. But you know, everyone has their justification and thinks what they're doing is okay. Hey buddy, where'd you go? Don't you want more Canada? What's this? That's what I've been addicted to. It's a freemium game sending me push notifications. For those with addiction, this whole idea of free will is a common argument to try and diminish the disease elements of addiction, i.e. trying to oversimplify it as all being a matter of choice and bad decisions and it kind of contributes to the ongoing stigmatization of people with addiction, seeing them as you know morally bad or weak. We see that attitude too commonly even among health professionals. Interestingly, in the eyes of the law, intoxication is not a defense if you commit a criminal act while intoxicated. There is a concept called the doctrine of prior effect where if you willingly consume a substance, knowing the effect it can have on your mind then you essentially take responsibility for all your actions that you may do under the influence of that substance. So unless you're involuntarily intoxicated, spiked, or it has a completely unpredictable effect on the mind, like drug-induced psychosis, then substance use disorder is probably going to be considered more as an aggravating factor for a criminal offence rather than as a mitigating factor, let alone a psychiatric defence. I'm gonna move here and here and then I'm gonna roll to kill this zombie. Okay, good idea. What are you gay wads doing? We're playing board games, so that Grandpa avoids the casino and I avoid freemium apps. See, they've got this little stable, sober support network now. Well, all right, good for you guys. Yeah. Tell you what, I'll join you. Board games go good with a glass of wine. That's not a glass, that's a trophy that you with won for drinking. It's not drinking, it's called a wine Zinfandel sipping sprint and it's competitive. Get off your high fucking horse. Your turn, Grandpa. If you roll a five or six, you can kill these zombies. You guys want to put some money on it? <laughs> It's not about 12 steps, it's not about a higher power, it's about a stable, sober support network and avoiding people that themselves just are temptation. Most of that was pretty accurate. So it's not quite as good as the one about ticks and Tourette's, but not bad South Park, not bad. Let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.